to Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome all. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 26, beginning at verse 36. It's a little lengthy what I'm going to read for you tonight, but it's so important uh, for our lesson. Um, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And Jesus took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith Jesus unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. And Jesus come unto his disciples and find them sleep and saith unto Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus went away again the second time and prayed saying, oh my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them sleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And Jesus left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that do betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with him a great multitude with swords and staves with the chief priests and elders of the people. Verse 48. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is Jesus. Hold him fast. And forthwith, Judas came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Lord, have mercy. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck his servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And Jesus said to him, put up again thy sword into, the, into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, are ye come out? as against the thief with swords and staves, for to take me, I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Blessed be the word of God. Our lesson tonight is a heart-tugging lesson. It's entitled, Lessons from the Garden of Gethsemane. In this season that we celebrate as Christmas, the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ, one of the high holidays that Christians uh, acknowledge worldwide, I thought it appropriate to pull from the Bible a passage of scripture that can help us really understand the relationship um, between the Savior and God and us with our Savior Christ. And to really understand some practical things we can pull from the Garden of Gethsemane experience that Jesus had that can manifest in our life a more mature, and a more robust 
Christian lifestyle. The Garden of Gethsemane was a place across from the Kidron Valley on the Mount of Olives. It was a place where the Lord retreated often. He prayed fervently in the Garden of Gethsemane before his betrayal and before he was falsely arrested. Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is technically the Lord's Prayer, not what we have been taught in the book of Matthew out of the Beatitudes, but this truly is the Lord's Prayer. And also Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is described in the four gospel books of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 26 that we just read from verses 36 through 56, in Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 50. In Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 53. And in John 18, verse 1 through 12. What can we learn from this experience that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane? I want to lay out several things for you six to be exact, that we can pull from Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. I want to give you six spiritual PowerPoints to walk away with tonight, six takeaways that I'd like you to meditate on and reflect on and, and to a, a adopt in your daily Christian living. One of the things that I want you to take away from the Garden of Gethsemane experience that Jesus had was that we all need a place to retreat. We all need a place to retreat. Turn with me uh, to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. Look at verse 2. John chapter 18, verse 2. And Judas, who was false to Jesus and had knowledge of the place because Jesus went there frequently with his disciples. This text not only lets us know about the betrayer of Jesus, but it also lets us know that from this account in the gospel book of John, that Jesus frequently retreated to the Garden of Gethsemane for prayer and for fellowship with his Father. A retreat is different from a vacation in that a retreat is a place for purposeful reflection, refreshing, reassessment, reengagement for response. Let me say that again. A retreat is different from a vacation. A retreat is a place for purposeful reflection, refreshing, reassessment, reengagement for an appropriate response. A retreat is a place to bond with others of like-mindedness for encouragement and enrichment. A retreat is a place where we should at least Surround ourselves in a healthy community, not a place of stress, not a place of, of drama, not a place of busyness, not a place of distracting entertainment, but a place of calm, a place where we feel a community of like-minded people that's peaceful and tranquil a place where we can mentally bear ourselves in complete transparency. A, a retreat should be a place of peace to unwind, to unplug. A, a retreat should be a special place of peace to bear yourself to God. Now, I know sometimes when we're at home, 
and we pray, right? But sometimes there may be some things going on in your life and you, and you might have a spouse, you might have kids, you might have family members, you might have loved ones in, in your, your home and there's some issues going on in your life that you, you can't bear to them, but you, you, you need to be transparent with God. And, and maybe it's tearful, maybe it's heart tugging where you're crying and, and you need to break down like that. But because you got family around, sometimes you can't let go because you, you sometimes are dependent on as the rock in the family. And so you, you, you feel like you just can't bear yourself like that because breaking down will just cause others to, to break down in a, in, a, in, a, in a worse way. So a, a retreat is a place where you can go and bear yourself with full transparency and vulnerability to God. A retreat is a place that's different from a vacation because a vacation is full of fun. A vacation is full of fun distractions and entertainment, but a place of retreat is where we go to meet with God, where we're in a community that's healthy, of like-minded people, where there's peace, where we can bear ourselves in full vulnerability to God. Amen. Amen, somebody. Yes, sir. Amen. And that's what the Garden of Gethsemane was to Jesus. He frequently went there for prayer. Yes, sir. A lot yes, of people think he went there this one time to pray before his betrayal. But we know from John chapter 18, verse 2, that he frequently visited the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a special place for him to retreat to. And we all need a place like that to get away from the busyness, to get away from the ruckus of life where we can go and be vulnerable in the, in the eyes of God and bear our soul. Where, yes, where if you're a woman, you can let the mascara run. If you're a guy, you can cry and let the snot bubbles pop. Amen. <laughs> where you can yes, just sir. bear your yes, heart to God. Yes. Amen, somebody. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Secondly, what can we draw from the Garden of Gethsemane experience? You got to have some trusted prayer partners that can look out for you. You got to have some trusted prayer partners that can look out for you. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 37 and 38. And Jesus took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. In other words, Jesus took his boys. There were 12 apostles that he chose to be a part of his earthly ministry. But out of the 12, Jesus had three that were a part of his inner circle. Simon Peter, otherwise known as Peter, James and John the sons of Zebedee. This world is unrelenting and brutal. You need, I need, we need some trusted friends, some prayer warriors that have our best interests in mind that we can take along with us in our vulnerability because Jesus revealed to them, I am very sorrowful. Yeah. My heart is very heavy. Can you imagine the Savior, this one who they saw raise people from the dead, heal people from their blindness, heal people from broken limbs that they may have had to, to, to do miraculous things, and to hear this one man come to them, this, this Savior, this Messiah say to them, my heart is heavy, but I need you guys. Because he bears the burdens of men. Hallelujah. Can you imagine what they could have felt when they heard the Savior say to them, 
I need you with me because my heart is heavy. Look out for me. I'm going off the prayer, but I need y'all to look out for me because I'm hurting right now. Right. Sometimes we need folks who are part of that inner circle. Yes, you may have some close family members, but there are some family members that are closer than others. You may have some friends that are close to you, but among those close friends, there are a few that are closer than others. You may have some neighbors that you're cool with, but out of all your neighbors, there are a handful or one or two that are closer to you than others. Jesus, out of the 12 apostles, who he ministered with, who he poured into, who he chose to turn this world upside down. Out of the 12, he had three that were special to him. And he took these three with him and he bared his soul and told them, look, man, I'm hurting right now. And I need y'all because you're special to me. You're dear to me. I need y'all to have my back tonight because I'm going through. And even though, watch this, we don't know what they prayed because they got tired of praying and fell asleep several times, but they did pray. We want to knock them boys for falling asleep. But how many of y'all can pray for an hour straight without getting woozy? How many of y'all can earnestly pray and not get a little tired? Mm -hmm. Some of y'all get tired after 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all be in mm -hmm. church for 15 minutes and, and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So don't mm -hmm. knock these three boys for falling asleep. At least they were there in the moment. And, and they were praying, by the way. Let's not forget that. They just fell asleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They prayed so fervently, they fell asleep. And Jesus knew that in advance, because Jesus knows all. He's an eternal. Yeah. Right. He knew they, they, they would fall asleep during that time. But guess what? He chose them because they were the, the, the closest in his innermost circle. And what am I saying? Peter, James, and John were part of Jesus' inner circle of trusted ministry leaders and, and his friends. These three were among the earliest disciples that Jesus uh, chose. When he embarked upon choosing the, the 12 apostles, these were the first three that he chose. When you read Luke chapter 5, verse 4 through 11, you'll find that it was Peter, James, and John that were the first three that Jesus chose. They were with him the longest. And you and I are not an island. You can't operate in this life alone. Mm -hmm. You, you okay. need people that, that can pray for you, that can handle your vulnerability, mm -hmm. that, that you can trust mm -hmm. and they trust you. You need Amen. folk like that in your life. Yes, you do. Amen. Yes, you. They must be. They must be vulnerable too. Come on now, Amen. That's a good one right there, Reverend Fred Robinson. Number three. Yeah. Don't let the shortcomings of those around you stop you from your assignment, mission, and purpose. Don't let the shortcomings of those around you stop you from your assignment, mission, and purpose. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 through 45. And Jesus cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what, you could not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, 
thy will be done. And Jesus came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Verse 45, then cometh Jesus to his disciples and saith unto them, sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus, he saw that his three boys, his three most intimate friends who had fallen Sister asleep. Sister Hawkins. Amen. God bless you, Sister Hawkins. Welcome. God bless. God bless. Welcome all that are with you. Jesus came upon the, this, his, his three friends, his three apostles, and he found them sleep again. And sometimes you're going to find your friends, your family, your loved ones who are closest to you. You're going to find them sleep at the will when it comes to times where you're going to depend on them and they may fall asleep with their responsibilities. They may fall short. And we all fall short. We all miss the marks. We all, let me say that for the cheap seats. We all fall short and we all miss the mark. Amen. And sometimes, watch this, we can be distracted from fulfilling our purpose and our goals because of the shortcomings and issues attached to those around us that we love. Jesus didn't let their, their sleepiness, Jesus didn't let their shortcomings stop him from his purpose. His purpose in the Garden of Gethsemane was to have intimate prayer and fellowship with his daddy. And watch this. I don't want y'all to miss this. As much as Jesus was going through a stressful situation about to face his crucifixion, about to face a false arrest, about to face pr police brutality by being beaten all night long prior to his crucifixion, he was about to face all of that. And then the actual crucifixion which is him dying on the cross for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He was about to face all of that and, and had the weight of all of that stress on him. And when you read in the gospel um, books of Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was praying so hard that it's described that it was if sweat of blood was pouring from his body that he was right. praying so hard, where blood vessels were bursting in his physical body from the stress of prayer and the stress on his life. But I don't want y'all to miss this. Out of all the stress he was dealing with and the enormity of the assignment he was about to fulfill by going to the cross and going through all of the excruciating torture and, and mockery, that he endured, he had the temerity and the mindset to still check on humanity. He went to check on his apostles. Jesus, even though he had all that going on in his life, he still took time out to check on us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. You and I can't control, you and I may not be able to control those that we love and those that um, we surround ourselves with that love us like family and friends. We can't control their life. They may fall asleep at the wheel. They may fall short of our expectations, but still love on them. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Even though their issues of life may, may be distracting. And, 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 and I'm sure Jesus, you know, was, you know, a little disappointed because we hear it in the context of him saying, y'all can't stay awake, you know, just for an hour, just to pray. Yeah. Remember, they were praying, though. Hallelujah. It just wore them out. Yeah. I'm going to give you five things that can distract you 
from doing what God has assigned you to do. Jesus stuck with his prayer and he stuck with his assignment. He didn't allow the shortcomings of his, his, his close friends and his apostles to distract him from his assignment. I'm gonna give you five things in life that will attempt to distract you. But I'm telling you folks, you got to stay the course and stay obedient to whatever the assignment is that God has for your life. But here are five Amen. things that can, can that can distract you in life. Number one, people can distract you in life. Good people can distract you because good people have issues like our family and friends. When issues come up and they fall short and they'll sleep at the wheel, it can throw us off course. One of the most precious people in my life are my wife and my kids. And when something's wrong with their life, I'm thrown off. But I got to get back on my square when I'm thrown off because God has a purpose and intent for me. And I got to stay focused because if I'm thrown off, I'm no good to them. Amen. And, and then not only will good people throw you, try to throw you off and distract you, but toxic people will throw you off if you let them. Mm -hmm. And enemies of the cross will throw you off if you let them. Amen. Amen. Secondly, places will distract you. Negative environments that you need not be in. If I'm a married man, I have no business being out on a date with another woman. If I'm if I'm a Christian man, I have no business being um, involved in pornography. Mm -hmm. If I'm a man or woman of God, I have no business gambling my hard-earned money away. Amen. Amen. I have no business being in those kinds of places around those kinds of people because they can distract me to the point if I'm not careful I can allow at some point their negativity to rub off on me so I got to stay away from um, negative people toxic people and toxic environments and then I got to stay away from and then I got to stay away from things that can distract me what am I talking Amen. about? Amen. Materialism. Materialism are things that you, you lust after so much that you put them before God, whether it's a house, whether it's a car, whether it's clothes, whether it's a degree, whether it's friends. You got to stop putting um, things in front of, in front of God because things Amen. can distract Amen. you. And then here's another thing that can distract you. Satan, if you allow him, he can distract you. Do you know that the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? That means the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in you can overwhelm and, and make the devil flee. But if you're not tapping into that power, Satan is always going to try to distract you. Amen. But guess Amen. what? Because the, the living God, his spirit dwells in you, you have the power to tap into that, into the spirit of God, so that Satan will flee. He may come back, but he ain't sticking around for long. Every time you tap into that power, the spirit of God, Satan can't overwhelm that. The spirit of God will overwhelm Satan every time. And it is Satan's desire to steal, kill, and to destroy the people of God. But you can overwhelm Satan by tapping into the power of God. Not my strength, not my will, but God's strength and God's will be done. It is the power of God that will quench the fiery darts of Satan. It is the power of God that will quench uh, and cause Satan to flee. Not my power, not my might. But it is the power of God that can overwhelm Satan. And then lastly, of the five distractions of life, you 
That's right, you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are your biggest enemy sometimes. Amen, amen. Yes, the Bible tells us in the book of James, when you're drawn away by your own lust, which yes, suggests yes. that there are some things that you lust after, there are some things that you like that are sinful. When you draw, when you're drawn away by those lustful things that your flesh craves for that are sinful and sin is conceived, my brothers and sisters, my friends, you are now in a sin condition. Mm -hmm. Those are five distractions that can take you off your focus. Don't yeah. let the shortcomings of others distract you. Number four, I'm giving you five lessons we can learn from the Garden of Simony. Lesson number four. Be persistent in cultivating and elevating your prayer life. All right. Be persistent in cultivating and elevating your prayer life. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Look at verse 36. Then cometh Jesus and said to uh, and said with them, I'm sorry, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, and he's talking about the three that he took with him, Peter, James, and John, sit here while I go and pray. pray. Look at verse 39. And when Jesus went a little further and fell on his face and mm -hmm. prayed. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 42. Jesus went away again the second time and prayed. Amen. Look at verse 44. Amen. And Jesus left them and went away again and prayed. Amen. Amen. The Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus not only Amen. praying fervently, but each time he's elevating his level of prayer. He's in deep fellowship in communion with his father. And what we need to learn from this model of prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is that we need to be persistent in cultivating a daily prayer life and elevating our level of prayer. Now, there are things that we pray for repetitively, and that's okay. Some people th think that that's not okay. When you read through Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 56, you see that it mentions that Jesus even prayed the same words um, when he went into prayer. So it's okay to pray for some things repetitively, but we need to elevate our level of, of communication and what we pray to God. Amen. See, some of you got some issues in your life and you're skirting around it. You're struggling with drugs. You're struggling with spending more money than you, than you have. You're, you're struggling with cursing people out. You're struggling with a bad disposition. You're struggling with all sorts of sinfulness and distractions that are going on in your life. And you're not praying about those things, but you're fervently praying about other stuff. Elevate your level of prayer and pray on those things that are plaguing your life. Paul elevated his prayer. He begged God. He said, look, man, I got something going on in my life. He prayed to God three times fervently. Remove this thing from me, God. Yeah. It's bothering me. God, I want to be praying in this. Y'all got some issues that you need to be praying for. You got people you should be praying for. Some of y'all got folk in your family that you're not even praying and fasting for. Let me give y'all a confession. I, 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 I had some, some struggles with a particular loved one in my family. We were bumping heads. And then I came to the conclusion, I got to be the rock for this person. If this, if this person goes through life, because they're going to go through life, and life is already hard. 
and I'm already a loved one, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a man of God, and I'm a blood relative to this person, and if I cannot be an example of somebody who's going to ride out with them, and I'm going to be a ride or die loved one in their life through thick and thin, no matter what they're going through, that they can say, at least Mike Robinson was in my corner thick and thin. Yes, I'm a hellraiser. Yes, I'm a problem. But golly, this Mike Robinson stuck with me through thick and thin. We need to be that kind of rock to the Amen. loved ones in our life. Amen. Jesus didn't kick those three to the curb when he found them sleep. He checked on them. We miss that sometimes. He came back to check on them. And we miss that. That goes over sometimes when we read this passage. We're so quick to condemn them. Oh, they couldn't hang and pray with Jesus. We're so quick as Christians to condemn folk. Christ didn't come into this world to condemn. He came into this world to save. Yeah, hallelujah. We're going to be the church about salvation of others. When are we going to be the church about being the ones who check on those who need checking on? Mm -hmm. And how do we affect that kind of change in our life? We cultivate ourselves in fervent prayer and we elevate our prayer by praying about the deep stuff going on in our life. And we elevate our prayer by praying about the deep stuff that's going on in the lives of others. That's how we elevate our prayer. That's how you cultivate a healthy, robust, and potent prayer life. Thank you, Cousin Tammy, for that heartfelt shout out. <laughs> My cousin Tammy is on our Zoom call, and I love her so much. She's such an encouragement. So am Jesus I. About his prayer life, and prayer is our intimate connection with God. Prayer is our dialogue with God, not a monologue. Because some people think prayer is a monologue where it's just us speaking, but prayer is a dialogue. How many of us pray intently, but also listen intently for what God has to say to us? God speaks to us through His Word. And God speaks to us through his quiet whispers to our soul. Mm -hmm. Amen. Number five of the six lessons we can learn from the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is this is going, this is going to rock a lot of y'all world, what I'm about to say. This is going to shake some of y'all to the core. Because some of y'all Christians ain't going to be ready for what I'm about to say. But I'm about to give y'all some biblical truth. Bad things happen to good people. Amen. Amen. Bad Amen. things happen to good people. Yes. yes. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Meet me at verse 45. Then cometh Jesus to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand that the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doeth betray me. And while he yet spoke, lo, Judas, one of the 12 came with him a great multitude with swords and staffs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Verse 49. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is Jesus. Hold him fast. Verse 49. And forthwith Judas came to Jesus and said, hail master and kiss Jesus. Lord have mercy. Bad things happen to good people. Jesus was perfect and he got betrayed. Mm -hmm. Jesus was sinless. And the person he poured into through the three years of his earthly ministry, the person that he had 
a part of his uh, apostle leadership, Judas, that, mm -hmm. that he taught and that he fed and that he empowered to do great miracles and works and wonders. That Judas betrayed Jesus. And Jesus knew from eternity's past that Judas would betray him. But yet he still poured into this man taught this man, nurtured this man. But that that's a big that, that there's a big lesson there that we can pour into people and they still may go wrong. That we can pour and mentor and develop and support folks and they still will stab you in the back. But look how Jesus knew that in advance and still loved on him. And the lesson there is Love your enemies. Because Jesus taught that in his word. Y'all ain't ready for that. Amen. Sometimes the very people closest to you will be the ones that hurt you the most. Yes. But you yes. still got to love them. Amen. Amen. I got people that break my heart often. Mm -hmm. People that I've given money to. People that I've shared secrets with people that I've, I've gone out of my way to spend quality time with and they've done stupid things to betray my trust. But I still have supported some of them and some of them I got to love from afar. Right. Because yeah. loving people doesn't mean you have to be a doormat. I hope y'all yeah. caught that. Amen. Amen. In this life, you and I are guaranteed a measure of trial, a measure of tribulation, a measure of drama, a measure of heartache, a measure of disaster. It doesn't matter how much you pray. It doesn't matter how much you fast. It doesn't matter how much you obey God's word. You're going to have some trouble in this life. And a lot of it's going to come from folk that you've supported. John 16, verse 33 says, these things I have spoken unto you, this is Jesus speaking, that in me you might have peace. Because in this world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, you're going to have some drama. You're going to have some mess. And it may come from the Judas in your life. The people who are close to you. But but know that as long as you have me, I will overcome whatever drama they bring to your life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank and you. Lastly, of the six lessons we can learn from the Garden of Gethsemane. Lastly, oh, despite life distractions, stay obedient to God's word. Yes. Despite life distractions. Yes. Stay obedient Hallelujah. to God's word. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 56. I'm sorry, verse 55 and 56. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and spears for, for to take me? I sat down daily with y'all teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Did y'all catch that? Yeah. Amen. Don't Amen. let life distractions take you off your mark. Stay obedient to God's word. Jesus didn't let any of this take him off his mission and assignment to go to the cross. He didn't trip on the fact that Judas betrayed him and say, look, man, I ain't going to the cross. All this, I, all this time I spent pouring into y'all and y'all going to forsake me and y'all going to leave me. No, he didn't trip over any of that. He's, he stayed obedient to the word. He fulfilled prophecy. He fulfilled the scriptures. He fulfilled what was foretold. Your faithful obedience draws the favor of God. 
Hallelujah is the word used for the highest praise to God. But it is our obedience to God that is the highest praise. Amen. Amen. Yes. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But watch this, y'all. That was his humanity speaking. But now the shift in the atmosphere occurs. And Jesus says, nevertheless, not as I will, but let thy will be done. We see the shift in the attitude, the shift from humanity that he had to his deity. Yeah. Amen, yeah. somebody. He yeah. says, I'm going to be obedient even though this is going to be a struggle, even though this tribulation is heavy, even though this thing is dramatic, even though this thing is trauma in my life, I'm going to stay obedient to my will because my will says I don't want to go through this. My will says I don't want to drink from this cup. That's what my will says. But my deity, my faith in God says, I got to stay obedient to this thing. And Jesus was obedient even unto death, death on the cross of Calvary. Even unto death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God. And that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Because Jesus was yeah. faithful and obedient even unto the death of the cross. He died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. But his reward was that God raised them up with all power in his hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to be obedient. In spite of the tribulation, in spite yeah. of the drama, in yeah. spite of what's going on in my life, yeah. I want to be a re I want God to reward me like God rewarded Noah. I want God to reward me like God rewarded Abraham. I want God to reward me like God rewarded Sarah. I want God to reward me like he rewarded Moses. I want God to reward me like he rewarded Isaac and Jacob and Job and Samson and David. I want to be rewarded for my faith. I want God to look me square in the eyes and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 What can we learn from the Garden of Gethsemane? Number one, we need a place to retreat. Number two, have some trusted prayer partners in your life. Number three, don't let shortcomings of those around you stop you from your assignment. Number four, be persistent in cultivating and elevating your prayer. Number five, bad things happen to good people. And number six, despite life distractions, stay obedient to God's word. I now want to open up for anyone that has prayer a prayer request on their heart or anyone that has a comment about tonight's topic, lessons from the Garden of Gethsemane. The floor is now open. What an absolutely powerful message though, sent yeah. from God for us. Hallelujah. Powerful message and definitely timely, definitely on time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you, my brother. I love you so much, Deacon Neville. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Lessons from the Lesson. Garden of Gethsemane. Listen to the wind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen 
to the wind. Hallelujah. We must listen to the great intercessor. Hallelujah. Who is the great intercessor? He abides within you and me. Yes, Lord. He is the one who communicates. Hallelujah. With Jesus. And Jesus communicates with God. Yes, Lord. We must listen to his voice He's, as he directs us. Hallelujah. Without him, we have no prayer life. Come on, man. Hallelujah. So listen to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And he directs us in our relationship with God. Yes, he does. And there's only two ways that our relationship can grow with God. Only two ways. Stay in the word. Hallelujah. Stay on your feet. Come on, man. Nice. Hallelujah. Nice. Stay in the word. Stay in the word. Stay on your knees. The word directs us in how to pray. Yes. And what to pray for. Yes. Amen. Yes. But we must, when we study the word, we must understand and really get the message. Yes. God's message to us. Comes through his word. Yes, it does. And God wants us to look at him the way he looks at us. Hallelujah. What are you saying to me, God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Through your word. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as I pray, God, I want I want you. No, don't be so quick to pray. Listen to the to the to the wind. Listen to God's voice when we go into prayer with Him. Jesus okay. said, "When we go into our secret, your secret closet." Yes. 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 The Father. Yes. Who sees you? In secret. Yes. In secret. Thank you. Reward you in public. Lord will reward you openly. Hallelujah. So as we go into your secret closet, listen mm -hmm. to the Hallelujah. Listen to the voice of God. Amen. Amen. As we close out, it's uh it's a festive season where we celebrate the birth of Christ. Don't ever say, but those of us that are Christian, don't water down the importance of this season. Don't say happy holidays to folks. Say Merry Christmas. Right. Be, be, right. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Say Merry Christmas because saying Merry Christmas means that you're bold um, for Christ and, and, you, and you are proud of who you serve. So everybody else in their faith have no shame about and no compunction about letting you know where they stand with your faith. So you you uh, be bold about yours. And it's not offensive um, if you're a Christian to say Merry Christmas, because that's what you believe. Amen. You're, you're saying Merry Christmas. Christmas means more Christ. And, and so Merry Christmas to all of you. And I pray that tonight's lesson and on, on the lessons Amen. learned from the Garden of Gethsemane was practical and helpful to you. If you would like to yes. um, learn Amen. more about the ministry of Greater Enon Missionary Baptist Church, uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, message me, uh, send me, uh, drop me a direct message, and I'll send you some information on our ministry. If you would like to sow a financial seed in our ministry, we're a Bible-believing and, and Bible-serving ministry. We're community-conscious uh, ministry. Um, feel free to donate by Cash App. Our Cash App 
address is dollar sign greater E9 94 dollar sign greater E9 94. And we'll be so happy that you did. Um, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for the people that gathered that are listening on our national telephone prayer line, that are watching on uh, uh, Facebook Live, and that are also watching uh, on our Zoom uh, Live. And so God bless them uh, with enriching power to not just hear what they heard tonight, but to be doers of your holy word. And Lord, we thank you for coming into this world to save those of us that are lost. Help us, Lord, to carry out your ministry um, to say yes. to lead those others who are lost into a salvation relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everybody. Take care. Thank you for that wonderful Amen. message. Thank you. 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 Thank you.